Hey guys, this is Jared, one of the creators here at Wisecrack. Today, we're talking about one of the best shows on TV right now, and a personal favorite, Rick and Morty. We know you're probably jonesing for some new episodes after the year and a half wait was announced. Tune in to Rick and Morty Season 3 in like... A year and a half! So, we wanted to hold you over with an analysis of Rick and Morty so far. The philosophy, the science, and everything you missed while you were laughing at the dick jokes. Lick, lick, lick my balls! <laughs> yeah! The horror. Rick and Morty chronicles the exploits of a mad scientist and his naive grandson as they go on deeply irresponsible and awesome space adventures. It's more or less the plot of Back to the Future, but Doc is a gassy alcoholic. I agree, Morty! Marty, or Morty, never tries to hit on his mom, and the duo travels through alternate dimensions rather than time. Rick and Morty is deeply rooted in the traditions of sci-fi horror, often paying homage to things like Ghostbusters, filmmaker David Cronenberg, Boy Morty, I really Cronenberg the world up, didn't I? Nosferatu, and Freddy Krueger to name a few. Looks like some sort of legally safe knockoff of an 80s horror character with miniature swords for fingers instead of knives. The show even references Zardoz, a camp classic and guilty pleasure of mine. Nowhere else will you get to see Sean Connery in a futuristic space thong. But seriously, see the movie, it's actually really smart. While the show pays homage to a wide spectrum of sci-fi and horror, it has an affinity for a particular sci-fi tradition, cosmic horror. Pioneered by literary horror legend H.P. Lovecraft, the cosmic horror genre emphasizes the terror of that which is outside our grasp to comprehend. Like Lovecraft, Rick and Morty uses the cosmos as a way to explore deep philosophical questions by imagining what lies hidden in the black depths of space. The show opening even makes a visual reference to Lovecraft's Cthulhu. Cosmic horror goes way beyond just cheap jump scares. It presents us with the vast unknown and unimaginable, that simultaneous feeling of fright, disgust, and dread that we feel as whatever lurks in incomprehensible space suddenly comes crashing into our own reality. Rick's portal gun is constantly confronting us with this unknown. As he jumps headfirst into other realities, the results are sometimes horrifying, sometimes hilarious, and sometimes both. Occasionally, that reality comes to us, particularly in the episode Get Swifty. Earth is approached by a giant space head whose sheer gravitational mass causes mayhem on Earth's ecosystem. The giant head commands the entirety of Earth to show him what they've got. Show me what you got! A cult soon develops to worship this cosmic entity, and Rick, realizing the head is a Cromulan, informs the president that they have to come up with a hit song and win the intergalactic equivalent of America's Got Talent. Get Swifty time today! Or be disintegrated by a giant space laser. Giant floating cosmic entities aren't anything new in the science fiction universe. Our old friend H.P. Lovecraft used the idea constantly, developing a race of great old ones who he describes in books like Call of Cthulhu and the Dunwich Horror. There are a few interesting questions that big floating scary things bring up. First, cosmic horror begs the question, are we significant? Most science fiction is convinced that humanity is, metaphorically, the center of the universe, whether we're battling the empire or trying to get all the aliens to just be friends. Humanity, or things that look like humanity, takes center stage. Cosmic Horror inverts that premise and asks the question, what if the universe doesn't give a shit about us? For the Cromulans, humanity is merely an object of entertainment. Annihilating a planet is not an act of spite or a cause for concern. It's just something you do. There's one every season. Cosmic Horror is full of these giant entities that demonstrate just how insignificant humanity actually is. And that's what is really terrifying, or in the case of Rick and Morty, kind of hilarious in a dark, dark way. In the book In the Dust of This Planet, contemporary American philosopher Eugene Thacker describes this cosmic pessimism prevalent in the horror genre that imagines a world without us, and thinks through the universe as absolutely unhuman and indifferent to the hopes, desires, and struggles of human individuals and groups. The show embodies this cosmic pessimism almost perfectly. Rick and Morty even die, only to be replaced by one of the infinite other versions of themselves in an alternate reality. Not only are we but a speck of dust on a tiny blue marble in the cosmos at large, we're also like one of an infinite amount of the exact same speck of dust. There's an infinite number of realities, Morty. Rick and Morty doesn't want us to be terrified of our own insignificance. It wants us to <laughs> laugh at it. <laughs> even though we are but specks of dust to these cosmic horrors, we too are the cosmic horrors to other specks of dust. 
In The Ricks Must Be Crazy, we learn that Rick's car battery is powered by a micro-universe whose sole purpose is to perform an inane task, produce energy. And in that universe, they invent another mini-universe. And so on and so on. Rick might as well be one of Lovecraft's cosmic deities to the denizens of the microverses. It's like cosmic inception, brah! It's like inception, Morty! In a multiverse beyond our comprehension, with infinite possibilities, values and meanings start to slip away. What about the reality where Hitler cured cancer, Morty? The answer is don't think about it. All that can remain is pessimism. Oh boy, what? Oh my god, no! Which brings us to our next section on the existentialism of Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty addresses the question of our very existence in almost every single episode. Oh, think about it! Existence is pain to a me seeks Jerry! Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's gonna die. On the one hand, we have the cosmic insignificance of humanity as a whole, and on the other, we have the frivolity of individual human life. That's my grave. The show offers us two examples of how to respond to our pathetic existence through Rick and Jerry. First, we have Jerry, who is seemingly oblivious to the soul-crushing mediocrity and pointlessness of his own life. He is literally more happy in a poor simulation of the world than his actual life. I am finally complete. Or as Arthur Schopenhauer might well have described Jerry's life, the life of every individual viewed as a whole and in general, and when only its most significant features are emphasized, is really a tragedy. But gone through in detail, it has the character of a comedy. Jerry is a failure. He's unemployed, his wife hates him, and he's not exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. But one can argue that Jerry is better off than the belligerently drunk Rick, because he's simply too dumb to realize that his life is pointless. But in this ignorance, Jerry seems content toiling away for the sake of nothing. Life is effort and I'll stop when I die! Then there's Rick, who understands the meaninglessness of life and accepts it. But despite Rick's sarcasm and nonchalant attitude towards pain and suffering, Hold your breath! <laughs> Hey, whoa, whoa, what the hell, Rick? He's also an alcoholic whose catchphrase means I'm in great pain. Wubba lubba dub dub! Do you know what wubba lubba dub dub means? It means I am in great pain. Please help me. The pure rationalism of the universe furthers the feeling of insignificance of our own lives. We're left with a paradox. Science allows us to make some sort of sense of the universe through formulas and theorems, but we as humans are left confronting the bleak, arbitrary nature of our own existence. Yes, I'd like to order one large sofa chair with extra chair, please. High chair. No, 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 no. Recliner. Science can reason away any sense of sanctity or emotion and turn the human experience into something meaningless. Rick takes time out of avoiding his own pending death to explain, mathematically, that Summer and Morty are both pieces of shit. Rick goes on to rationalize away his feelings for Morty, explaining that their bond is only an easy way to hide Rick's genius brainwaves You're as dumb as I am smart! from the intergalactic Popo. In another episode, Morty, as Roy, grows up and dies in a video game. After losing, he briefly forgets his own existence. Where's my wife? Morty, you were just playing a game. The audience is left to question what exactly separates the fake reality of the Roy game to his own existence. After all, if Morty remembers his fake life and experiences all the emotions and sensations that constitute our own consciousness, what's the difference? Rick and Morty is constantly playing with this dichotomy between meaningless simulations and our actual life. Holy crap! If we recoil from the idea of living a fake life inside a video game, it's because we ascribe some meaning to the authenticity of our own waking life. But Rick and Morty is quick to display for all that that is a giant crock of shit. No! I wanna be with Gary! What's the difference between killing the memory parasites, whom the family feels genuine emotion for, and shooting, say, Mr. Poopy Butthole? <laughs> Butthole. This crisis of values, of our own meaning in life, is taken up by tons of existentialists, but our old friend Friedrich Nietzsche is particularly helpful here. Nietzsche tells the parable of the madman, who comes into town screaming, God is dead and we have killed him. Now, what Nietzsche was really trying to say is that after the Enlightenment and the Scientific Revolution, the big being in the sky that gave value to our lives was no longer relevant. After the death of God and philosophy, what remains is nihilism, a void of meaning. My 
life has been a lie. God is dead. The government's lame. Thanksgiving is about killing Indians. This struggle over the lack of meaning is what defines Rick Sanchez. Rick uses science to demystify everything. Does evil exist? And if so, can one detect and measure it? Um. Rhetorical question, Morty. The answer is yes. You just have to be a genius. Love is just a set of chemical reactions. What people call love is just a chemical reaction that compels animals to breed. He even beats the devil and, in a way, actively plays out the death of God. Yes! you, God! Yes, I did it! There is no God in your face! We're constantly left wondering, what does Rick care about, if anything at all? Rick's character embodies a tension between a kind of active and passive nihilism. The passive nihilist for Nietzsche is resigned to the hopelessness and meaninglessness of life. The active nihilist, however, actively seeks to destroy the old values and start anew. Well, scientifically, traditions are an idiot thing. A bomb! I'm gonna drop it down there and <gasps> get a whole fresh start. <gasps> it's clear that something makes Rick tick. We're just not sure what. After all, he's labeled as an intergalactic terrorist fighting for something, and eventually, he gives himself up to say, his family. Rick's actions may seem paradoxical, if only because he himself is struggling to make meaning out of the universe. The show also does its part to interrogate our own sense of morality, refusing to draw clear lines between right and wrong or good and evil. I will kill anyone, anywhere. I just love killing. Morty's attempts to be a do-gooder are always thwarted. After freeing a group of people from the body-snatching unity, a nipple-driven race war commences between the now-freed rabble of pedophiles and prostitutes. When confronted with the grim consequences, Summer aptly replies, I didn't know freedom meant people doing stuff that sucks. Herein lies another existential question. What is biological life without living? Listen, Unity, I don't think my sister's trying to say that life would be perfect without you. I think she's just saying that life would be, you know, life. If we, the audience, are repulsed by the thought of body snatchers, the show also makes us consider the fact that our irrational attachment to freedom is what allows us to live in a world that is oh so terribly fucked up. Another way to look at the existential question in Rick and Morty is through the work of Albert Camus, specifically in Me Seeks and Destroy. I can't take it anymore! I just wanna die! We all wanna die! We're Me Seeks! The central tenet of Camus' absurdism is that life consists of two irreconcilable facets, the human tendency to find meaning in life and the universe's complete indifference to our existence. In Rick and Morty, we see the opposite of this in the Me-Seeks. Me-Seeks and I'm born into this world, fumbling for meaning, Jerry! We are created! to serve a singular purpose for which we will go to any lengths to fulfill. For Camus, human life was exactly the opposite, as illustrated in the myth of Sisyphus, the king who was sentenced to spend an eternity pushing a boulder up a hill, only for it to fall back down upon completion, over and over again. Or for Jerry, it's not a boulder, but his golf swing. And then there's this. Earthric C-137, the Council of Rick sentences you to the machine of unspeakable doom, which swaps your conscious and unconscious minds, rendering your fantasies pointless while everything you've known becomes impossible to grasp. Many characters in the show, rather than seek meaning for their own existence, simply resent their creators for bringing them into this world. I didn't ask to be born! We see this Frankenstein complex not only in the Meeseeks. He wrote me into this! Well, that one over there wrote me into this! Well, he wrote me into this! But in Aberdolf Linkler, You brought me into this world, a suffering abomination, tortured by the duality of its being. But but I shall finally know peace when I watch the life drain from your wretched body! Morty Jr., and of course, Frankenstein's monster himself, makes an appearance. For Camus, we are perpetually frustrated by our floundering attempt to find meaning and purpose in life, and our inability to do so. He offers, as an alternative, to embrace the emptiness of the absurd. Or as Rick says, The answer is don't think about it. Or to quote Morty, Nobody exists on purpose. Nobody belongs anywhere. Everybody's gonna die. Come watch TV. The fictional and sometimes almost real science of Rick and Morty allows us to explore all the ways that, despite our love for Rick, our lives are as sad and pathetic as Jerry's. Oh, Jerry. But the science in the show also works as an excuse for some really nerdy jokes. Our time's gonna need a little time to, you know, stabilize. Some are obvious, like the entire episode loosely based off the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. This principle from quantum mechanics, pioneered by a notable meth dealer, states that it is impossible to know both the location and momentum 
momentum of a particle. That's because the tiny objects that make up our universe are at the same time waves and particles. If that's confusing, it's because it is. Rick and Morty draws humor from a superficial reading of science here, claiming that this uncertainty of quantum mechanics can cause our own realities to split. Outside, a sea of Schrodinger's cats are floating around, a reference to the 1935 thought experiment by Irvin Schrodinger. It ponders, in a quantum world where particles can be two things at once, is it possible for a cat rigged with an elaborate quantum booby trap to be both alive and dead at the same time? Because Austrians have dark, dark imaginations. This tenuous relationship to scientific truth could be viewed as a jab at the science fiction genre for constantly inventing scientific mumbo jumbo to justify unlikely plot points. The DeLoreans are a microscopic life form that resides within all living cells. Like stupid and smart brainwaves canceling each other out. In another episode, Rick is seen traversing tiny climates on a tiny planet, which is not at all how that works. In the same episode, the show's creators poke fun at the trust we place in TV narratives by making a joke about forced perspective. I thought it was further away. The show also exhibits a unique kind of atheism that constantly invalidates religious figures by boiling them down to pure science. F all previous existing religions. I'm going out onto the sidewalk, I'm dropping to my knees and pledging my eternal soul to the thing that literally controls the f***ing weather. It also acknowledges the frequent misuse of science by those with religious agendas. You can't kill the truth, father! In Something Ricked This Way Comes, Jerry's personal interpretation of science leads him on a crusade to reinstate Pluto's planethood. He is greeted by the Plutonians, who have not so subtle crosses in their eyes, drawing a comparison to religious fundamentalism. Of course, it's all a ploy to manipulate Plutonians into thinking the destruction of their planet by their corporate overlords is totally not a big deal. Hmm. So to pull it all together, Rick and Morty is a show that holds nothing as sacred. By exploring the absurdities of a purely rational universe and pushing the boundaries of decency in a sci-fi horror setting, we get to ask all sorts of fun, depressing questions like, why am I here? And what's the point of it all? We're not really sure where the show will go with Rick's character. Will he finally do something for the greater good? Or is his latest move just another bleak, self-serving ploy? As always, thanks for watching. Wubba lubba dub dub! We hope you're liking these special episodes. We have some amazing new videos around the corner on the South Park movie, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, and lots more. Be sure to check out our channel page by clicking here, where you can see more of our brain-tickling videos. While you're over there, do be sure to hit the subscribe button. Another great way to support the show is by supporting our sponsors. This episode is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible is the world's leading source of digital audiobooks. They've got more than 180,000 downloadable titles across all types of literature, including bestsellers, latest releases, and classics. And if you're looking for a book recommendation that's wacky and fun like Rick and Morty, and want to be all ready when our video hits, check out Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams. For more about Audible and to start your 30-day free trial, go to audible.com 8-bit to sign up. Thanks for the support, and as always, thank you for watching.